So how many have you done so far? How many have I done so far? Yeah. I don't know. There's like nine or ten. There's, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven to go. These, the, we're going to lash the boom spar, we're going to the foot spar, the boom. We're going to lash the boom through these eyelets. You were saying that you had to make sure that it was flat on both sides. Flat yeah, it has even. to, you know, to look right, it should look the same on both sides. So when you look at this side, it should have a nice even circle of punctures and distance of the threads and everything. It should look the same on both sides. So, and, then, and it's, it's challenging because, you know, your experience teaches you how much you have to reach out away from the ring and gather up the material to get the ring so that it looks like it's kind of halfway in. Like if you look at that, you see the ring is kind of like halfway in there, so. Takes about five minutes to sew this in. And in the old days, the ring was not necessarily metal. You could make a ring out of rope and sew that rope ring in and then put a metal liner on the inside. And that was a way of creating a strong point in the sail. Hmm. And that's what this is all about. It's a strong point, you know. It's it's sewn by hand because that makes it r really solid, and that'll that'll last as long as the sail will. And this tool, the palm, it's kind of hard, hard leather, and when you get a new one, it's, it's a little longer out here, not by much, but it's got little leather tabs, so you soak it in water for a while, and then you put it on your hand, and start tightening it up, and you wear it wet while you're working, so it forms itself to your hand, so that becomes your palm. And the idea is that the needle, when it's held right, you'll take that needle and you'll put it back and you'll steer it right into that thing. They call that thing the frog. And so when you're pushing the needle through, you push the needle in like this, like a, like a lever. And then if you need to, you can push it further with this. And once it's over that little opening, then it's just simple to pull it through. Now today we were looking at a film about uh, Bernard Mortessier. I can't say I'd call him a friend, but uh, we had a lot of interaction and good times together and a lot of laughs, but we didn't spend a lot of time with each other because he was always sailing somewhere and so was I. <laughs> but uh, he's a, he, was, he was an inspiration, like uh, he would, I would write him letters while I was building my boat and and he would answer me with multi-page, carefully considered, articulate responses. And he didn't know me from Boo, but you know, I wrote him and asked him a question and he wrote me back. And I think he 
he belonged to a different mindset completely. He, he just wanted to be on the ocean. Someone asked him once if he was interested in mountaineering and he said, probably in the next lifetime. So he was only interested in oceaneering. I made a sail for his Joshua, yeah. And he liked it. He even wrote a nice letter, said he liked it. You were down in Tahiti when he was uh, in, in, in um, Ahe. Yeah, the first place that we sailed to on the Seminole was Ahe because the, the fellow that was sailing with me, Patrick Humber, had built a, he had also wrecked his own boat. And uh, he was sort of marooned on, on uh, Ahe. And so he, he built a, a little place of his own on Bernard's little motu, Poro Poro it was called. So we got to spend a lot of time with Bernard in his house there. Didn't you help him with the soil? Helped him, helped him with, uh, helped him with hauling soil across the lagoon. He would, we would go and sail across the lagoon and, and fill gunny sacks up with soil out of the, the forest area. There were a lot of birds, so there was a lot of bird shit and leaves on the forest floor. And uh, go take that back. And he had all kinds of little uh, garden spaces created out of coral blocks. And so you'd put that soil in there, and, and he was growing everything. Yeah, everything you could imagine, cucumbers and tomatoes and watermelons and lettuces and, and this this little motu was barren otherwise, you know. There would have just been coconuts and that's it. Coral sand and rock and coconuts. Instead he turned it into something. He, he had uh, collect, he collected seaweed and fertilized with the seaweed. Pretty interesting human. You know, he could have been famous and he just walked on the whole deal. <laughs> the snake pit, that's what he called it. The snake pit. Couldn't go back. Another one done. Another one done. So I have to ask, um, because I'm sure um, other people besides me would want to know, um, what are all the band-aids for? <laughs> what, what's, what about just so you ones? don't bleed over the sail? <laughs> What, what happens to It's you? really simple. What happens here? Your, your right finger. Huh? What happened? What happened to that one? Uh, well, this is the one where you uh, you constantly scrape your knuckle against things, right? You're pushing the needle and you're scraping across other thread and cloth and and eventually the skin all wears away and then pretty soon that's bleeding and then you're smearing blood all over everything. And this one here, I just plain stabbed myself and it was bleeding. That, that's all, you know. Oh, and this one here is another one of those ones where when you push your hand through this, this little, right on the corner there, you keep tearing you get like this, you do that just unconsciously. You don't put your whole hand over, you just put it like this. And so that little 
cuticle there gets all ripped and torn and pretty soon it hurts like crazy. <laughs> That's what the band-aids are for. We had a guy working for us when we first opened Maui Sales. His name was Peter Moftu, and uh, he had the most gigantic hands. Just, he was the perfect hand worker, and he really got into the art of hand work. You know, you can make it look really, really precise and beautiful. And he really got into it. And sometimes his, his hands would just be this mass of bandages all over. But, you know, he would sit and sew rings all day long, just like this, you know, because the way we were building sails back then right, for heavy commercial boats, this is what you did. And so if you made a sail that had rings like this, the this stuff was going to outlast the sailcloth. And so it made sense and make the sails last longer. But nobody, nobody's going to pay anybody to sit and sew like this anymore. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen. So what do you do? Well, there's a few lofts that still sew like this, I think. I'd say, uh, you know, Port Townsend sales, you could probably find this work. And, and the Shaw Tower, for sure, you could find this work. I, I, I just don't really know. I'm not that aware. There might be more. You know, it's just traditional sail so making. Is, is that Tanara three? You no, know, like this this tools. I'll bet you 500 years, humans have been using this tool. And you know, until the 19 maybe 30s, let's say, at the outside. People were still sitting on deck, hand sewing sails back together on sailing ships, you know. So, what, a hundred years ago, let's say, hand sewing. Well, Why like were they a... hand sewing? Well, because they were on a sailing ship. And it didn't have a motor. It didn't have batteries. Or... It had kerosene lamps, even in the... Even in the 30s, you know. those old wind jammers, you know, those guys, they were so tough. The ones that run around the Cape? Yeah, run around Cape Horn. They were, they, were, they were just tough humans. That was amazing. Tough humans. Well, they say the safety net was 100 feet above deck. <laughs> <laughs> because you were how many feet above that? Oh yeah, About well, two or three hundred feet above it. Yeah, two hundred feet at the top of the yeah, the top of the yards up there. Yeah. No. That was, but that was it. That was how cargo got around the world. That was how mail got around the world. That was how uh, humans got around the world. You didn't get around the world in those days unless you were on a sailing ship. Is to it. So the adoption of burning fuel to travel on the ocean is a very recent thing in human history. And this is a very ancient thing. And you know, it still works perfect. <laughs> they probably haven't changed the design for a hundred years. Pretty, yeah?